Good evening and welcome to the British Library. It's very nice to see you guys here in the theatre and to all of those around the world watching online. It's great to have you with us as well. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to be uh, launching two new, or helping to launch two books tonight. Uh, obviously here at the British Library we love books, but we also love music. Uh, the library has one of the world's biggest collections of music and uh, alongside the natural sounds and other voice sounds, it's the, it's the National Sound Archive. So books about music are really, really what we like. And, and tonight we've got uh, two extraordinary books uh, which we're going to be discussing tonight. This woman's work and uh, Vashti Bunyan's memoir, Wayward, both from the amazing White Rabbit Books imprint. Um, so... You'll, in a short while, you'll be uh, s hearing from uh, Sinead Gleeson and Zaki Sewell in conversation with Jude Rogers. And then in the second half, you'll be meeting Vashti Bunyan. So all the both the books are on sale outside tonight. And if you're watching online, you can go to the top of your screen and you can find a tab that says books and you can also buy them there. Um, at the end of the first half, we'll have some chance for some questions. Uh, likewise, if you're watching at home, you can uh, put your questions in the field below the video screen and our chair, Jude, will, will be able to read them out. And um, then we'll, at the end of the second half, you'll be able to put your questions to Vashti. Um, and that's a pretty much it for me, but except to introduce our chair for tonight, Jude Rogers, who is also from the fantastic White Rabbit Books, about to publish her book, The Sound of Being Human, which is creating a lot of interest. Uh, you may have read about it in yesterday's papers. Um, Jude is a, a music writer and a, a writer on many things for it. She's pretty much written for every national newspaper and every bit of the music press. Uh, so she's in very, very good safe hands tonight. So please welcome to the stage Jude Rogers with Sinead Gleeson and Zachary Sewell. Thank you very much. What a lovely introduction for all of us. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight, whether you're here in the room or online. Um, I have Sinead Gleeson, Zakia Sewell. Um, we're going to be talking about this anthology. Um, Zakia is going to read from her fantastic piece as well in a, a little bit. Um, but first of all, um, this is a book which Sinead has just seen the finished copy of for the first time because it's out this week. So she's very excited. <laughs> um, now, this is a book that you edited with Kim Gordon. Mm who um, is the woman, we can, I'm on the cover of the book there. Um, how did you come together to make this book? Tell us the story. Uh, well, Kim is actually an artist as well. And I mean, a lot of people, she's so synonymous with, with Sonic Youth for so many people, including myself. But before she was in Sonic Youth, she went to art school and she's been a practicing artist for a really long time. Uh, and she came to Dublin in 2019 to the Irish Museum of Modern Art. She had a solo exhibition. And they contacted me and said, would you do a public interview with Kim? And Bodyhead, her band, her amazing kind of experimental band, were playing in the courtyard outside. It's an old military hospital. It's kind of like a quadrangle thing. And there's, we, did the, we did the interview. It went great. And then there's a tiny little pub, as there always is in Ireland, uh, around the corner from the gallery. Uh, that um, myself and Coco, her daughter, was over. Elaine Khan, who's brilliant. Um, Heather Lee, who ended up writing the introduction to the book. Um, we all kind of went for a drink there and in Ireland you're not supposed to talk about politics or religion in the pub um, <laughs> but you could talk about music so we did and we, we had a kind of chat and I knew that um, Kim was going to London to see Lee Braxtone our amazing publisher because he had published Girl in the Band a book I, I loved and I had interviewed Kim about at the time and um, he said you know he'd like Kim to do a book and she was like I don't know if I can do a book on my own I'd edit anthologies so it seemed like the two of us together might work and we liked each other a lot and yeah it was it, it came from there so there you were in the pub hatching plans um a little bit and you know you mentioned briefly you know you knew her before but um yeah. i interviewed you for you both for the guardian obviously you in yeah. on via zoom in dublin kim in la yeah and um but you met well you'd met eyes before and i loved this the fact that yeah. you were a fan as as a teenager of kim yeah. and her you know that her personality and her energy is something that very much informed the spirit of the book as well. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and I, I like, I, you know, I was I was growing up. My teens were it's a different book that I published before. A lot of time spent in hospital, and the two things that kind of kept me, I think, alive and and sane were were books and music. You know, they're literally the two, either side of a, a set of lungs for me. Um, 
And Sonic Youth were a band I, I discovered around 15. And the first time they came to Dublin, um, they played this really small, grimy, sweaty venue. That, uh, and I think I talked to you about it at the time. Like, in your memory, I thought it was like 200 people. And I, I, people on Twitter were talking about it going, it's 500, it's 600. But, <laughs> but it, was, it was definitely still, you know, the crowd was maybe... 80% men and there was a lot of sweat dripping off the ceiling onto your head. That happened to McGonagall's all the time, but I loved it. Um, total fire hazard. You wouldn't get away with a venue like that now. Um, but I remember like it being in the queue outside and there, the Sonic Youth, the tour bus was there and Kim got off the bus and got, and I think she kind of clocked me because there, there weren't many women in the, the queue and 16 year old me just, oh, it's Kim Gordon. There she is. Um, and I saw them the, the following year, they, they played a different venue with, with Nirvana where they support and it's, it, it, oh, their weird connection to the book is like I used to send off to, to Seattle to, to for the Sub Pop Singles Club and buy all my early, like I have, I have that weird expensive version of Bleach that has a different track on it. Um, <laughs> That I'm, that's for eBay when I'm old and frail. <laughs> uh, and Meg and Jesper, who's in this book, said, like, I, I used to stuff the envelope. I probably sent, I remember sending things to Ireland, you know, the ads in the back of the enemy. So, and that's the thing, like, this book has loads of weird overlaps and conversations and, and echoes and, mm. and mirroring in a weird way. Lo lots of people mention the same kind of artists. There's lots of stuff mentioned in Zaki Singh that's in, you know, things that I mention or, mm. yeah, so it's... Um, yeah, it was, it's I, it's it's really brilliant to me because Kim's been brilliant to do this this book with, and yeah, it's been brilliant. The thing that struck me about that anecdote as well, you know, this high proportion of men in this crowd and these two women clocking each other, mm. um, it just made me think about how, you know, music is talked about in general as such a male thing. You know, I've heard I used to work for a music magazine which was classed in W. H. Smith as a men's magazine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this was in the two thousands, but I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised. It's still the case, um, and. You know, still, I'm a woman who's been working as a journalist for nearly 20 years now, and I've had several off-the-record conversations with other female journalists, some of whom might be in the room, about how still it can feel like, um, even when you've got a lot of experience, it can feel like a bit of a shut-up shop. And it may be, you know, I know you obviously work in a different field. You're, yeah. Zach, you're a broadcaster as well, a fantastic broadcaster, brilliant. Um, you know, um, it feels sometimes like carving out a space to make women's stories, you know, kind of, as you say, blend together and bleed together is quite an interesting place to, to you know, quite an interesting thing to do. Um, it's quite a different anthology of women's writing, I find. There's been women's anthologies before, mm. um, but this is not just female music journalists talking about women. It's um, women who are first-time writers, people like Megan Jasper, who worked at Sub Pop. There's, there's, you know, and there's some you know, quite well-known writers like yeah. Anne Enright, you know, yeah. won a Booker Prize. Um, took a brilliant piece about her, how much of a fangirl she is of Laurie Anderson, and that is such a wonderful piece. Um, but also, I know you wanted to get younger writers and newer writers through, and yeah. obviously, you know, people like Zakia into yeah. the mix as well. Um, tell me a little bit about, you know, how you put together the team of people, um, you know, your perspective before we get, have a reading from Zakia. Yeah. Uh, myself and Kim, we, like it was split down the middle. There are 16 pieces in the book and we just took eight each and we decided you could do, you could ask who you wanted. Um, you could try and not make it all people who look like, you know, me and, and Kim, because that would be a really boring book to me and other people, I, I would think. Um, I also know that like I was a music journalist for years and I, I, I towards the end of that, before I started moving towards writing more about books is that, I interviewed a lot of bands and a lot of people and, you know, I interviewed people like, you know, Dolly Parton and Kate Bush and Nick Hayes, people who've got a lot to say, but a lot of bands didn't have a lot to say. And <laughs> I, I, I found that deliberately, in a way, for me, picking people who are not necessarily music writers and yet some of the best essays in this book, Jen and Liz Pelly, who are incredible music journalists and writers, um, I, a book mm. like th this needs that kind of linchpin, I think, as well. But I think it's really interesting asking somebody who's just very good at writing to ask, a, to ask them about a specific kind of subject, whether you ask them to write something about sport or music. Um, and I didn't know that Anne would say yes, because I've never really had any conversations about music with Anne. And then when I did ask her, she was like, I'm really into music. And again, mm. people wouldn't think that about her. Mm. And that's the thing, we don't know the... The, the pockets of things that people are interested in. So it was eight, it was eight writers each. We didn't give them any brief. We said, you can write about what you like. And we only checked at one point to make sure two people weren't writing about the same thing. And I, I think, you know, I've published a book of essays myself and I often say that, uh, you know, an essay, even if you really want to make it about one thing, it's, it's impossible to do that. It's never a singular thing. It's always, it's, it's a very fulcrum-y thing, lots of things orbit around it. And if you might decide, I'm just going to write about, you know, Kate Bush, or I'm just going to write about Kanye, or, you know, Little Nas X, or whoever it is. Mm -hmm. And it'll end up being about multiple things, because often you funnel your own experience mm -hmm. into it. It's, it's the nature of the essay. It's a very um, 
kind of malleable and bendy kind of form and that's why I think so why not add music into it and I I do want to say also before it doesn't get said that Jude's book is coming out as an amazing and she had a brilliant piece yesterday uh, in the Observer which talked a lot about the neuroscience of music and how we feel about it and how we remember and what we think about things when we hear a song and how it can transport you and I don't think I don't think looking at a painting makes you feel the same way as listening to a song it's a very kind of deep cerebral sort of experience that will take you back to like a, a Christmas or a childhood friend or whatever. And it's it's a really deeply embedded thing, but do read her piece in the paper. It explains it better than <laughs> I'm explaining it. So, yeah. Um, so, Zaki, tell me about how you came to be involved in this book. You know, was it was it Sinead on the phone kind of uh, nagging you or you, were you just uh, excited to do it straight away? Well, it was sort of a, a new a new venture for me because, yeah, I, I'm sort of, yeah, as you know, I work usually with audio rather than um, in the written form. <laughs> so I think it was Lee, actually, um, who, who published it, um, got in touch with me and, yeah, with this incredibly open brief of sort of write about music, which is kind of like, you know, a wonderful invitation, but also quite terrifying because you think, oh, my God. Music, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so broad. But um, actually, around the time of the the invitation, um, a, a, my dad had sent me this recording of my mum singing um, before I was born, and that reminded me of this other tape that I've sort of grown up with of my mum's singing voice, which then became the sort of starting point for the essay. So it was sort of the timing was all kind of uh, you know magical, and um, yeah, I just basically I just started, and as you say, you know, you, you start off writing about one thing and. Suddenly, I think because in particular this tape that I, that I speak about in the in the essay is so kind of evocative for me, it's sort of so much has sort of flooded in, and it was mm. yeah, it was a very um, yeah, it was quite a powerful experience for me. I think especially because the essay is so personal. Mm -hmm. So and you've obviously made you know documentaries before. Um, I don't know if it's still online, but um, my Albion Zakia series on Radio Four about a year or so ago yeah. was incredible. It's one of the best music series genuinely I've heard about um, ideas of identity and about you know your family in Wales and the Caribbean and in London and you know it's wonderful but obviously you know this is it's a fantastic piece of writing would you read some yeah I'll read, a, I'll read a little bit <laughs> yes oh in the real book it's very it's exciting it's like bending for the first time <laughs> yeah okay so <clears throat> I don't remember the first time I heard it, but I've listened to it a hundred times before. The crackle of tape hiss like some old ethnographic recording. The jangly guitar intro that sounds like it's being played at the other end of the room. The clattering of cymbals, and then her voice. Ethereal and soulful, familiar and yet strange. She sounds remote at first, like she's singing off mic. And then there she is in full beam. The bass and the drums and the flute and the keys are all much louder and yet to me barely audible. I can only hear her voice. She sounds so high pitched and young, like a different person almost. Her voice is much lower now. It sounds like it emanates from the deepest parts of her or deeper still from the very center of the earth. Back then, so delicate, sinuous, soaring high above the rest of the band striving for something just beyond her reach. She sounds happy, but there's something telling in her vibrato, in the way it swells and quakes. My mother, a ghost, immortalized on tape. I think it was recorded at a rehearsal. The quality isn't great, but I like the feeling that I'm there in the room with them all, somewhere amidst the cables and the instruments and the half-smoked spliffs. Perhaps I was there in some form, the promise in a loving glance exchanged between her and my dad. It was definitely recorded before I was born, though. Everything had been filled with hope before that. They were about to sign with a record label and were gigging all over the country. Legend has it that she performed until she was eight months pregnant. Perhaps if I tried hard enough, I'd be able to remember what it felt like, bouncing around on stage in her belly, hearing the hum of her voice through all the fluid and flesh. Thank you. And got a shout out, my mum, who's, who's in the room now. Yeah, mum is in yeah, the there room. She is. <laughs> <laughs> you should do a bow now. <laughs> um, we've talked about this before, Sinead, but um, you know, music is a way into so many different subjects, isn't it? You know, in this book, there is music and politics and the music of exile. Um, there is music and 
feminism, of course, you know, that's going to come through this mm. music and identity. Um, tell us a little bit about the piece that um, you wrote, because when you're editing a book, choosing what you're going to write yourself must be quite... I, I was kind of hoping that I wouldn't have to write anything, but, <laughs> but Lee Braxton was very insistent. <laughs> um, so, uh, and again, it's, you, you probably had the same experience. It's really hard trying to focus in on one thing where you have a subject that you love, and there were a couple of topics I was thinking about, and then I think lockdown definitely affected that in some way. Um, so I decided uh, to write, it's, it's funny, somebody else has written a piece that I've seen that's coming up that talks about this book and makes a really good point about the idea of legacy and history and who gets recorded and who doesn't, um, which I think is really important in terms of especially the, the music Kurt Co and Alan mm. Lomax and which also, you know, the Sis Cunningham mm. essay and all the, the Almanac singers. Um, so there's loads of little, again, those little echoes in the book. So I, I kind of felt that I wanted to write about somebody that nobody knows. I, I, I love when I find an essay about a weird thing that I know nothing about, mm -hmm. and you read it and go, God, I now want to go off and find out about eclipses mm -hmm. or whatever it is, or you know, some strange island that nobody ever goes to that's tidal or something. So, <laughs> but I, uh, my husband is a composer and producer, and we've worked together before on things, and we've worked together in the last year with a couple of artists, and he is a massive. He makes music. He's like put out music, uh, electronic music, and he's really obsessed with Wendy Carlos. And he'd been always talking to me about her, and I just got quite obsessive about finding out about a person who was not only brilliant, but probably, in fact, definitely overlooked by virtue of being female, I think, in a lot of ways, um, by virtue of being also, I think, a trans woman, um, working with Hitchcock on more than one film, but also d deliberately kind of deleting her own uh, visibility from online. So I talk in the essay about the fact that you can't, you can't, you, you, you might go on to Spotify, you'll find two songs from The Shining she composed. Uh, the, Sh the Shining, Tron, Clockwork Orange, um, but has deliberately been taking her own music away, moving herself, making herself, it, which is a contrast to the world we're living in now. Everybody's living these curated Instagram, Facebook lives and desperate to tell people who they are and what they do, even if that's not very much. Um, and, and yet she is a real kind of auteur and, and outlier, and, but is making herself more and more invisible. And I fear she's still alive, she's 83, and I just wanted to write about how there's not enough written about her. Her legacy is slipping away because she's kind of chosen it in some ways. But, you know, also you, you might know about Moog synthesizers if you're, if you're nerdy and geeky about synthesis and music um, or, or into any kind of, you know, lots of bands you saw on top of the pops in the 80s mining with synths. Um, <laughs> you know, Bob Moog was only able to make Moog synths because Wendy Carlos was a, a physics and a music genius that was her degree, double degree, and made his synthesizers better. So a really fascinating and complex kind of person that, that loads of people don't know about, and I hope. So I could have wrote about some, I could have wrote about Sinead O'Connor or Kate Bush, and I, I, I might still do, but Wendy, for me, felt like the person. And again, listening to the, her music and the shining and in the lockdown and stuff, and at home and with the studio at the end of our garden where we're listening to her a lot. It just seemed like the right thing. Again, it, this is the thing that happens with when you're commissioned to write something. You're, the right time comes. Um, I, if you'd asked me a year previous or before, you know, maybe I'd write about something else. But it felt like the subject for the time. Mm. And also, you need know, to talk about it. You know, during lockdown and mm. your responses to music, you know, changing during that time. You know, not many people would listen to the, sh the Shining soundtrack. Do you? Know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. <laughs> I, I, I did. Because, you know, it's, it's somebody stuck in a place with their own family going slowly down. <laughs> so, yeah, probably Perfect. not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. And a writer as well. A writer stuck somewhere going, trying to write a book, which I was trying to do. Yeah, but I, but it I, turned out so differently, couldn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, completely. Um, in terms of the mix of, of writers as well, you know, obviously you've got the American and British influences coming in, but you've also got other writers from around the world. Was that important to you to get different perspectives? You know, it's, it's an interesting book to... Some of the subjects do touch on music and politics, and yeah. you know its importance to identity. And I think when we, when I interviewed Sinead and Kim, um, it was about a week after the war had broken out yeah. in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and there are pieces there that have resonances, you know, that, that you know, but how music is such an important thing, and how it is something that is, you know, not tolerated in repressive regimes and yeah. um, you know individual yeah. musicians um, like Victor Yara was mentioned in one of the pieces. Absolutely, who was, um, you know was tortured and yeah. you know and, you know musicians who were killed. Um, you know, um, it was very important for you to get you know some political content. Yeah, I mean for sure because I, I think people forget all the time that 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 music and song can be so political. Again, I grew up with an older brother on the other side of my bedroom just playing Billy Bragg songs all the time on his guitar, <laughs> and 
you know, also if you grow up in Ireland, you know, a lot of the songs you hear are very political. A lot of them are very, not very nice by the British. Um, <laughs> and you, so lots of so, so, song and narrative has a place to make, tell a political story. And Fatima Bhutto's essay in the book is, is, is kind of about like exile and about politics and what's happened in Pakistan, but it's also about leaving the place that you love and the, the how, again, that triggering of memory and how mm. going away from a place will remind a song can take you back to where you used to be. Also people smuggling songs out of like, there's, she talks about a, a song that was recorded um, in a stadium that, that you, could, you can find it on YouTube, but there's no footage of it, but it's a really grainy, somebody recorded, I don't know how they did it, an old tape recorder that would have got you shot if you'd have played it at the time. And again, that idea that political music can have a very potent and, and, and life-changing um, effect. So I think that, and then Eon Lee's piece, which is a different kind of piece about coming to America from China and learning, learning, learning to speak English by listening to pop songs, but also the memory of listening to Chinese propaganda songs, like how, how, how potent the propaganda can be, like, you know, the, the great leader stuff. And again, we're looking at a completely brutal totalitarian genocide mm -hmm. thing happening in front of us at the moment, it, 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 you know, trying to erase the identity of a whole country. Mm -hmm. um, and so hearing the Ukrainian national anthem at the moment feels like a very completely powerful and political thing. And, um, you know, Zaki, you write as well about um, folk recordings. I love the bit how you write about you know, Alan Lomax's recordings and thinking about, um, you know, the kind of, you know, the, the saving of music and the kind mm -hmm. of, um, you know, setting down of music. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, in terms of, you know, this book coming out now, um, you know, as I said, I've been a journalist for 20 years, and it seems the last five to 10 years, something has changed in the way that women's stories are coming out about music. Um, you know, you're a broadcaster um, who, you know, they seem to, be, they seem to be operating a world where there are so many more women mm. coming out and doing things. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that? Because um, how old are you now, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, oh, I'm 28. For one more day, it's my birthday on Wednesday, so oh, I'll be 29. Happy birthday. <laughs> we all think. No, let's not <laughs> And the book comes out on the day after my birthday, which I Oh, very nice. Yeah, nice. Best but, birthday present yeah. you But it feels like um, there's something changing in your generation of broadcasters and writers that, you know, from you know, from, a, from my perspective anyway, you know, I look online, it's, um, you know, online journalism, some of the websites, and there's so many, such a more, more diverse range of voices. You know, it's not just, you know, offence to all the lovely white gentlemen here tonight, <laughs> including Lee Braxton, who we have to say <laughs> has been really instrumental in getting lots of women to work together. Um, but, you know, it's vastly changed. Is, it, is that a fair assessment, you think? Or um, is, are there still, um, is this still a world that's quite hard to navigate when you're a woman? Um, I would say I think it has changed. I think it's very open in a sense. I mean, there's still obviously all the old kind of doors close, et cetera, et cetera. But I think particularly with the sort of rise in, you know, there are so many more platforms in the radio, for example, there are so many kind of independent radio stations and that kind of gives more space for people to sort of um, approach music or share music in a, in a different way. I think, I think a lot of, people that I know perhaps have been afraid maybe to write or to kind of do a, you know, a radio show because they don't have all the facts or they don't know or they haven't been on Discogs for, hour, you know, looking at all the dates and pressings and yeah. that sort of very kind of um, analytical or collector-like approach to music. And I feel like the sort of breadth of platforms means that actually we can, there are spaces for people to, you know, tell, tell stories in slightly different ways or choose music and, you know, have a more kind of feeling approach, not to say that that's all women have, you know, a feeling approach, but um, that sort of frees up the possibilities, um, not that you don't have to sort of know every single fact and, and figure about mm. a particular band to write about them. And I think that's also something that comes through in the book is that there are some very, there are some, you know, m far more kind of studious approaches, that kind of tr more traditional journalistic yeah. styles, and then there are very personal pieces. And I think, you know, it's all of those approaches that kind of give a balance, you know, because music is, it's on the one hand, we can look at the the pressings and the dates and yeah. the and the facts and you know um, also there's something incredibly um, emotive, um, indescribable and sort of mystical about music and its effect on us as well. And I think it's sort of bringing those two things together is is always nice. Oh, absolutely. And that is not generally something that is allowed mm. in music journalism and mm. music criticism because you know it has to be objective. Mm. It has mm. to, you know, not let emotion enter the mix, mm. which is something I sometimes find quite hard <laughs> when I have to yeah. be, be a critic. Um, no, there's a place for criticism, of course there is. Um, and in terms of um, that world, um, you know, opening up um, Sinead, um, 
you know, what, what have you seen in kind of, um, you know, you, you obviously talked about your, you know, work as a music journalist interviewing Kate Bush, oh my God. You know, I just wanted to do a, a two hour interview about what that was like. Um, actually, <laughs> what, what was that like? Tell, give us a little. It, it's twi <laughs> it was twice, which sounds terrible. It I'm was sorry. twice, wasn't yeah, it? Oh, it was already yeah. on the phone. All but, right, all right. But, but, <laughs> But lovely, um, but also, you know, Kate Bush's mother was Irish and I think she really was keen to talk to Irish journalists as well. But no, I'm t <laughs> as lovely as you expect, like big, big chats. Great. <laughs> Tell you after. Well, you know, you've been a music journalist, mm. you know, um, you, you, did you see this book as a chance to kind of represent the world it was now or can, um, a more or um, a more diverse range of voices? Um, in terms of, you know, including people who are older writers, um, yeah. you know, people like Anne Lennon-Wright, who's been around for a while, and younger yeah. people, to get that, to get everybody on the same page? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, if, if you put together any, whether it's a compilation or a Spotify mix or whatever it is, if you put, like, 20 or 15 or 40 of the same people in it, that's not interesting, you know, it's really not. So, to me, it was like, you know, and I think, like, Margot Jefferson, who has an incredible mm. memoir coming out and wrote a brilliant book about Michael Jackson uh, for Granta, uh, her memoirs out in, in May, we're hoping to do something in, in, in Dublin. Um, I, I just, she, again, just it's sort of pick, pick people you like, like you, you pick, like Rachel Kushner is also someone I've, I've, already, I've always loved, Ian Lee. Um, it, you're, you're, it, it just seemed to me like a really obvious thing to pick people that you, you, you know who can write really interesting stories. But again, books, and, I mean, I, I've edited anthologies before that were like fiction, there were short stories and stuff. And again, they existed because the Irish canon was very like male dominated or the same kinds of stories. Um, and it, so every book that kind of begets another book. And I hope that like after this book, somebody else will do a book like this and then we'll have a completely sub differently subjective experience to me or the other writers or kin within it and, and, and do something else with it. Because that, I, I, that's my experience, books beget books. And again, that kind of visibility, like there's, would have been really hard to get a book of Irish short stories by women published 10 years ago and then I did a couple of them and then there's been loads since. So I hope that this book starts another conversation again, ex again, around voices that are like, I'm very conscious of being like a, a cis white woman, but because so, we need other stories apart from the stories that I might edit, we will need different others. I think actually Saki should edit the next collection for White Rabbit, I'm just putting it out there right now. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. I think I think that can that can happen because I, I, we're always always learning and, and learning. You know, you need to read kind of omnivorously and, and and broadly. And I hope I love anthologies because they're they're like a grab bag. It, it, they're like a mixtape. Sorry for the terrible analogy, but they are. You don't know what you, you mightn't like every essay or piece in it, but you're probably going to learn something even with the, every piece you read within it. And this is quite a diverse mixtape in terms of the format of each of the tracks or to each of the chapters. Sorry. Yeah. Because um, you have. Um, you might mention the Margot Jefferson um, yeah. piece about Ella Fitzgerald, which has lyrics and it's, it's beautiful. It's, yeah. and it's quite formally interesting. Yeah. Then you have the piece about Drill, which I know your son was very, could, couldn't believe that his mum had commissioned a piece about <laughs> rare, Rarely cool to teenage children. But, like, <laughs> but he was like, there's lots of people in this essay that I actually like. Um, <laughs> um, but then, you know, I, I, I remember like it, it, over the lockdown, pulling all of the vinyl out of the shed to look at stuff. And he was like, oh, you have all, they have the first Nas album, like, ah, oh, moment of coolness, which you'll never, ever, <laughs> Forget. Um, but yeah, no, I, I and I think that this is it's an ongoing conversation. Like I could I could write a whole separate book about my dad and the impact he had on me. My dad was like had a full time job. It was a bass player and played in bands and was, you know, making us watch Stop Making Sense when we were 10 and <laughs> playing loads and loads of music to us. And I, if you don't I think everyone you talk to most people who write about music or interest in music, how's that person? It's the older sibling, the uncle, the parent who just kind of went, you need to listen to this. And we all need those kind of people. And I had it in my dad and I had it in my, my older brother. Um, and I think there's probably like, does your, does your mom love music? Because apart from the singing and stuff, does she, she loves music? We could ask it. No, we <laughs> get her up. Um, you know, definitely, yeah, I grew up in a very, very musical household. But there's a thing in- There's so actually, much music mentioned in your, like your essay, like the, when I was looking at all the references, yours is probably one of the biggest for how many? Poetry. Yeah, well, I think what was, you know, when I started writing, I didn't know what, I didn't know what the end point was going to be, but I think it was this idea that, um, you know, this tape that I had of my mum singing was a sort of portal, a way to connect with a version of her that was, you know, from, of, of the past. And my mum has uh, mental health issues, so that's the kind of the crux of the essay, was that this tape enabled me to connect with the, a lost part. Yeah. And then that sort of opened up that this idea, well, there's actually so many formative pieces of music or albums or that I've discovered that actually help me to connect with other sort of fragmented, lost, discarded, forgotten aspects of my identity and heritage. And I sort of write about um, my experience of working in a record shop um, called Honest John's, which is uh, down mm -hmm. the road on Portobello, uh, on Portobello Road here in, uh, in London. And um, this sort of um, 
process of discovery and the sort of, you know, actually, you know, discovering my blackness through music imported from yeah, yeah. Um, 1970s um, America or, you know, discovering these Alan Lomax recordings of my, of, um, of, of, from an island where my mum's um, parents were from, Karaku in the Caribbean, that I didn't have much connection to growing up. So um, that, 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 that sort of, it revealed itself um, through the process of writing that, that actually, um, music has been incredible, uh, incredibly important for me to sort of, yeah, re reconnect severed links. Um, and I think that's something that lots of people will be able to um, connect to, whether it's, you know, a family member yeah. or a place. And as you say, it's so evocative, like a smell. Yeah. It can take you back instantly mm. to, for sure. to, to, to something um, in the past. So, so, yeah. And there are these, you know, as you say, connections between the chapters, even though some of the stories are very, very different, obviously. Um, what was the most surprising essay you got back? Or anything that's, um, you know, you're thinking, oh, you know, there's because there's, there's quite some quite, I was going to say provocative, but no, you know, there's uh, there's lots of interesting things about the body and there's writing about, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of um, Juliana Huxtable's piece, which is very physical. Yeah, it, it, that's an incredible piece. And, it, and again, this is Juliana's essay had the effect that I think I hope the whole book has on people in that Juliana wrote about uh, a woman called Linda Sharrock who made an album with her husband Sonny in the 70s called Black Woman. And Juliana was going out with this guy who said, oh, you need to listen to this album and played the whole album for her. And she said it was she a bone shaking, foundation crumbling experience. Um, it was a sexual night as well. That was probably part of it too. Mm -hmm. But it was also like some a, a woman, because lots of that album is, a, is about how you use sound there's lots the song she mentions is not there's no lyrics in it but it's just a, a woman and a black woman using her voice and doing this incredible kind of gymnastic sort of ululation a sort of really primal beautiful i i find the way she's i i as soon as i read the essay i was like straight onto mm -hmm. the internet and looked at every clip i could find and listened to everything i could find and it's unbelievable and it's like you know i i, I also want to make the point that like laurie anderson who's a subject of Anne enright's essay is 75 this year so is linda sharrock there'll be a lot of attention on laurie anderson mm. um who is wonderful but i hope there's lots of attention on linda sharrock as well because that's a, a brilliant and quite an experimental kind of essay in, in lots of ways um, and I, I'm so glad, because Julianne again, like him, is an artist most of the time and a DJ. She's always DJing. Um, but I, I think that's, yeah, that's a, that was incredible. And, I, and again, like that too, people feel not confident, I think, sometimes about writing, because Julianne was like, can I speak to you on the phone about this? Can we talk? And when she said, I don't know if you like it, and I got it, I was like, oh my God. Um, be, but then that's a natural thing. And I think there's, women feel that a lot more than men mm. do, that idea of like, I won't be good enough. Who's going to read this? I don't know if I can even write. Um, but every essay in the book was of a, an immense standards so yeah and that's that's the danger when you no brief what are you going to get back maybe i don't like it <laughs> but everything was was just above and beyond i was we were, kim and i were really lucky and zaki you mentioned the word rabbit hole and i know Sinead, you said before this but this you know is a book that takes you down rabbit holes you know it introduces you to new artists it makes you li listen to other artists the first thing i did um, when I started reading this, it was just making a, I started making a Spotify <coughs> playlist, and then I found out from Sinead that Sinead was making a comprehensive <laughs> playlist. I'm making a massive, it's <laughs> massive, uh, it'll be online soon, but yeah. like really big. Yeah, and yeah, it will take you ages to do it, but um, it's a fantastic book for just reminding you about music you might have liked or, or introducing you to new artists that you that are just fun, fascinating and intriguing and you might want to uh, dip into more. So it's a very generous book which um, I found really interesting because a lot of music journalism books or music writing books yeah. are very like, you know, as you were saying earlier on. I know all the stuff. I know all this yeah. and it is mine. This makes me really, really clever. And it's like, no, I know this and you might like it too. Mm. Yeah. It's got a great spirit about it. Um, we've got time for some questions now. Um, I have an iPad somewhere um, to look at the online questions, which I thought was here, but it's not here. Um, but um, if anybody has questions in the audience, do raise your hands and be brave. I'll be pointing at people. <laughs> oh, there's a hand up there. There's a hand. Yes, thank you. Hey, um, I loved your podcast, My Albion. It was great. I just love it so much. It kind of planted a seed for what I've decided to do my dissertation with my MA. Oh, so I'm just wondering whether you've got any further plans to do podcasts because it was just great. Uh, not currently. I, <laughs> I, um, I did. I, I did put forward another um, big bombastic uh, series for Radio Four, which I think was was rejected based on the current climate of it. But it was a bit 
too political for them. Oh, okay. good. So, yeah, surprisingly. Um, so that so that one is is sort of gone back underground. But um, I am sort of thinking about writing uh, something of similar themes on kind of Britishness, nationhood, identity, folk culture empire and things like that so that's kind of stewing slowly <laughs> although i think i need to turn up the heat a little bit <laughs> um, i want to read more about you on pentangle <laughs> pentangle in a way is absolutely wonderful <laughs> absolutely wonderful <laughs> do we have any more questions yes there is a microphone up here yes there is down here oh, it's, oh we're both the person at the top and then we'll come down to you sorry Hello. Um, Jude, you mentioned that the landscape for discussing women and their relationship to music has shifted dramatically over the, I think you said the last five years. And I, I, I wanted to know what Sinead and Zakia's futures, I, ideal futures for discussing women and music and their relationship to women it might look like. Uh, I went to see Kate LeBon playing Dublin about uh, two weeks ago. And I was out afterwards, I was talking to the promoter and there were three or four young women who wanted to, you know, chat and we were talking afterwards who were all music journalists. And I just know when I was bec being a music journalist and there was, there was literally like one or two, it was one, a friend who's a friend of mine writing for the Irish Times and then me and then there wasn't mm -hmm. anybody. And again, it's like, if you don't see it, you can't be it. Mm -hmm. So the landscape in Ireland again, like lots of places was music journaling was a very male bastion. Um, and that's really changed. And I think the internet has democratized things a lot and things like, you know, Twitter and TikTok and all those places that you don't need, a, you know, an editor to commission. You can find your own way and you can talk about the things you like and you can tell narrative stories about music. So I, I find that that's getting a, a lot better. And again, like with everything else, I just think it, it, more different types of voices uh, are always important, not the same kind of people who... Um, come from the same backgrounds, look the same, talk the same. Um, that'll always be interesting to me. But I, I was really reassured to meet all these young women who are all music journalists in Ireland. It's not a thing anymore. It's not even a conversation. But it was a big thing when I was trying to do it, for sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. What was it like? Um, I mean, I guess what I would say is I agree. I think that, yeah, as I said earlier, the sort of, the sort of number of platforms or the accessibility, as you say, you can sort of have a much more DIY approach. You can start a podcast. You can, you know, you can... You can find an audience, um, but but then you still have to look at you know who anyone can find an audience, but who are the yeah. people who are actually still getting paid, published, and For sure. and not so much on the you know the journalistic front. But I've been asked this question about like you know female DJs or artists, and you know you still there's still so many festival head you where know, all the headline oh, slots or it's, it's all it's all men and yeah. it, they're you know it, although in some little small circles and in kind of perhaps. Um, in our in our networks, it feels like progress, um, and that, not to downplay that progress. But I think it's when we look about who really gets to the top and who yeah. is actually who who is making the decisions yeah. and where the money is. I think maybe that's still actually, a little bit. A, slow. a minor point as well, which I think is evidenced by this book. Not all places are, places are publishing two and three thousand word close, long investigative deep criticism of music. It's not really there anymore. Mm. Um, and I'd love to see more of that. Mm. And if I can add a point as a as a Women in music journalism. <laughs> um, online and in um, lots of newspapers, the writers um, are, you know, there's so many more women, which is great. Um, but there is a magazine um, out this month, um, a mu monthly music magazine celebrating a birthday, which has one woman on the cover. It has loads of names. And there was one woman on the cover in a very small bit near the bottom. And that happens every month. I think you've Monthly said music magazines are an area which need more women in. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you, you've said as well that, like you and another female journalist, you know, only get asked to interview women sometimes, as mm. opposed yeah. to just, you know. There are some editors mm. in the past who have. Um, I have another. I'm, I won't mention her by name because she, she probably wouldn't want me to mention this in public. She might. She probably does actually. But I'm not going to. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> but um, we just say. Um, if I've been asked to interview uh, Laura Marling, who's a fantastic musician, and basically we get the Laura Marling call from certain editors and that's it. Mm. Female singer-songwriters we get to interview. Mm. It's like, you know, I wrote a piece about Georgia Moroder for The Guardian last week. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but th that still happens, even with somebody who's been doing this for, I've been doing it nearly 20 years. Yeah. So there are still things to, mm. that need a lot of change. Yeah. And I will continue ranting about this more in the next year. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? There was a gentleman dead here. And we have one more time for one more question after that. Thank you. You're so right about music magazines. 
Thank you. Every month, I'm seeing a counselling group edited once a couple of times. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's kind of a follow-up maybe from the previous question, but it's more about the behaviour of... Uh, this is probably too generic a question, you're not going to be able to answer it, but the behaviour of men in audiences at concerts. Um, I was at a concert recently by a well-known, very popular band, Six Music Darlings, and I was absolutely seriously taken aback at the behaviour of the, the young lads who were kind of just harassing and haranguing the girls who were in the audience and kind of mm. pushing them back and doing the whole kind of mosh pit stuff. Is there any sense that that's ever going to get better? Because... For an old bloke like me, do you <laughs> feel like it's any better than it was back in 1978? Right. What do you think? Who's, who's most in mosh pits from the three of us? <laughs> I, I, I haven't been in many mosh pits. I haven't moshed in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's a problem. Mm. It's a problem. Um, because, you know, in a way, a, da a dance floor can be is a kind of little microcosm of, of the world outside. And if, in fact, it's a bit like being on Twitter, in a way, a dark room where people can sort of get, think they can get away with stuff <laughs> they wouldn't really get away with in broad daylight or, you know, face to face, whatever. So I think the, especially as a DJ and with a lot of friends of mine, um, f you know, who, who are female DJs, that, you know, I, I've actually got a friend who, just sort of taking a break because she, you know, the way that she was treated, it's either people don't take you seriously, like the bouncers don't take you seriously when you're sort of yeah. been lugging your records and they sort of think, oh, you're not one of the DJs or whatever, or they don't even let you into the booth, or that you, or you do your set and then after, my, my friend had a particular experience, she did her set and then after she just got groped in the club and it was sort of like, you can't, there's a sort of um, a contradiction where people sort of want to put female DJs or, you know, um, on the stage, but then they don't actually create places, spaces that are safe for them to be free to dance. And, and so there is, I think, it's like greenwashing. You know, yeah. it's the sort of thing where you're, you're willing to sort of um, promote or change, make superficial changes, but then if the spaces themselves are not, you know, hospitable or, or safe for, for women, then, yeah. you know, it, there's a kind of, there's a, there's, there's a conflict. So I think there's still a long way to go. And I think it's just alcohol. I think it's just the worst, it's sort of, it's a, it's a bit of a free space where people, the worst of people yeah. or the best of people can sort of come out, unfortunately. Yeah. I think I've seen a couple of bands, uh, you know, all male bands, um, talking about it on Twitter, so like, you come to our shows, please respect women and stuff. And I think, do think you need more of that. Um, but yeah, maybe just be a decent human being and don't do that stuff. You shouldn't have to be told by a band on Twitter not <laughs> to do it. So, yeah, mm. maybe. At least these conversations are happening, which they weren't 10, yeah. 15 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to stop there. If anybody has any questions um, subsequently, um, if you're here in the room, I'm sure you can talk um, to Zaki and Sinead um, later. If you're online, um, I'm, well, you might be able to, to tweet them. It's up to them. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much for, um, for this book and for the chat, um, Zaki and Sinead. And um, give them a warm round of applause. <laughs>
28 years ago, yes, I wanted to write it for my children. Um, and I wrote a fair bit of it, and I sent the synopsis off to a few people and got nothing back. And so, of course, I just gave up. Thought, well, no good. I like the album, no good. <laughs> And this was a period, obviously, this is, this is 28 years ago, this is 1994. You haven't made music for years. Mm -hmm. You haven't sung for years. Yes. Um, you have three children, one of whom was still quite little then, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But your life was very different. Very, very different. Very different. And it was only when I got onto the internet in 96, when I put my name into a search engine. It was Alta Vista then. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite a pioneer, 96, is it? Know, yeah. <laughs> uh, and up came all these references to, to Just Another Diamond Day and to other uh, singles that I'd made that had never got anywhere. Um, and that set me off on, on music again, uh, to finding out who it all belonged to, whether we could bring it out again. And uh, it did, Just Another Diamond Day came out again in 2000. And it gave me a whole other musical life where I'd had 30 years of no music at all. And so the thought of writing the story just went away. And, I thought, uh, and then I made another album for, in 2005. And I thought, oh, I'll get back to writing after that. And I didn't. And then I made another album. And I thought, oh, I'll get back to writing after that. And I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> until the beginning of lockdown, and then it happened. So you had a call from um, Kieran Evans, Kieran who made Evans. a wonderful film about yes. Vashti. If you, um, I, I saw it at the time, and also I saw it early on in lockdown, the first lockdown yeah. in 2020, because um, uh, The Social, which is a fantastic institution in central London, um, went online, obviously, and showed the film again. And Kieran Evans is director, and it was made in about 2008, is that right? Late yes, 2000. We, we took about four years to make it, actually, yeah. but it was about the journey. We, we went on the journey that I had made with the horse. We did it bit by bit by bit, and yes, this beautiful film came out called From Here to Before. Mm. And at the beginning of lockdown, Kieran called me to say that he wanted my permission for putting, a, putting it up online for a few mm. weeks. And he said, so what are you doing just now? And I said, well, I'm writing, but I wasn't. I lied. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, I know somebody who would really like to, to look at what you're writing. And that was Lee Braxton. And so I sent some things to Lee, and this is the result. Why do you think you said to him you're writing when you weren't? I have no idea. I can't remember. I think I had to say I was doing something. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't this, you know, deep <laughs> desire that you were ex expressing? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. What has it been like to write it? Because you know, we get a lot more detail about your early life, your mm -hmm. family, and yes. some of the very tough things you went through. Yes. Uh, well, I think initially, Lee thought that it should just be about the journey with the horse and going up to the Hebrides. Um, and I thought, well, no, that story by itself, you know, it really needs the beginning and the after, the before and the after. And uh, that's what I did in the end. I, I, when I started writing about my childhood, um, I, I really enjoyed that. Mm. And then to, to move into the journey uh, and then all the, all the times afterwards. I really enjoyed that as well. I had quite a few bits of writing about the journey that you know, I'd been doing over the years. But the, the bit about my childhood and the bit about the music afterwards, I'd never written about, and I, I enjoyed doing that. You had quite um, an unusual childhood in some respects. Well, first yes. of all, you have an um, older brother and sister Mm -hmm. We're called John and Susan, John and then you come along and you're called Vashti. <laughs> Which, yeah. well, I, I, interviewed, um, Sh um, I interviewed Vashti for the, um, the Guardian recently, and uh, you were saying, you know, kind of, um, sometimes you still see your name written down, you think, you know, John, Susan and Vashti, why did they do that to Why me? did they <laughs> do that? Why did they do that But you to were me? named after your dad's boat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
yes, well, Vashti was the name that had been found by my grandfather in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the book of Esther, about a queen who refused to dance for her husband, the king, uh, in front of all his friends. She just refused, and she was actually kicked out, and he married Esther instead. But my father's father, when my father was going to marry my mother, he nicknamed her Vashti because she was awkward and, uh, as he said, disobedient. And I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't know her then. But, um, yes, yeah, so Vashti was then given... The name Vashti was then given to my father's boat. And then when I came along, five and a half years after my sister Susan, for some reason they decided to call me Vashti. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously in the late 60s, you've been Vashti. It was, you know, mid to late 60s, so it was a gift, an absolute gift. <laughs> well, it has been, it has been. It wasn't a gift when I was at school. <laughs> it was awful. But yes, it has been in my later life. Can you tell us a little bit about your parents? Because I find it fascinating finding out about them. You know, quite complicated, interesting characters. You know, your father himself, oh, you know, yeah. an inventor and a mm -hmm. bit of a rogue, you said. Yes, yes. Well, yes, he, he was, but he was an amazing man. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, but I had a violin that, I, uh, that my brother actually helped me buy in Portobello Road Market for two pounds. He gave me the money to buy it. And I learned violin a bit at school, at my day school. And then I was sent to boarding school, and I took my violin with me. But the teacher there just had me play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star every single week for a whole term. So I left my violin at home for the next term. By the time I got home again, my father had sold it to somebody who came to the door looking for old things. And he also bought me a piano for passing my O-levels. And uh, again, when I got back after the first term of studying for A-levels, he'd sold it to a passing <laughs> dealer. And that's kind of what I remember about him an awful lot, apart from the fact that he was a wonderful man and his ideas were before their time. He sold my piano. Yeah. <laughs> And your, my heart did break for you when I wanted to, wanted to your name. I mean, I couldn't play it or anything, but it was a beautiful, beautiful creature inlaid with swags and little candlesticks. And it was a lovely oh, wow. thing. I love that in your book, you know, you talk about these you know, obviously very difficult aspects of family, you know, taking mm. away something that's so important to you. But, um, you know, your father was trying to invent things and um, he yes. was a dentist and, yes. and he was always trying to help other people. So you had yes. those different factors coming in. And it's yes. quite rare to read about somebody experiencing such love for a parent and you know, talking about the difficult aspects. Yes. And then your mother, obviously, whose story really yes. touched me. And I think it's quite fundamental to your idea of who you are because you didn't want the life that your mother had. Yes. Can you tell us yes. a little bit about her? I, I felt that uh, she was... She was a dancer, she was a wonderful singer. Um, and then she married my father and she was never able to, to have that part of herself again. And I wrote a song about her, mm -hmm. about watching her through a slightly open door as she danced by herself. And, and the piano that my father got me, my mother could play that and I watched her play that. And it made me, made me very sad in later life that my mother hadn't been able to do the things that I've been able to do. And that Nick Drake's mother, Molly Drake, who wrote the most beautiful, beautiful songs, mm. her songs have been published after she died. You know, and it was the same for her, that she was a wife, she was a mother, and the other part of her didn't matter. Um, mm. And that made me sad for my mother. But she, she had a, she loved being a mother. So am I sad for the wrong reasons? I don't know. Am I sad because I put myself where she was? Maybe she wasn't sad about it at all. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I was sad for her. And you talk in the book about your teenage years and, you know, this very traumatic thing that happens when a mum 
has a stroke and it's yes. you know you and you hadn't been having a great time with your mental health as a teenager and mm -hmm. Um, yeah. that book, that part of the book, I just had to put it down and just take uh, a breath. You know, it's, um, just thinking of how it, because it obviously had a huge effect on me. Would you mind telling people who haven't read it, telling us a little bit of that context? Uh, about that, yes. Uh, I think I haven't mentioned the word in the book, depression or post-traumatic stress or any of those things, but I, I went through a really, really bad patch and the family doctor put me on well, first of all, he put me on bananas and steak, which didn't work. And then um, he gave me Librium and Valium and some new antidepressant. And it made me utterly crazy. I could not keep still. And I said in the book, the only relief was uh, going up the down ex escalator in Marble Arch tube station, because at least I kept still in the same place. And screaming at my mother, that nobody could understand this kind of agony, and I didn't know how to describe it even. Um, she went downstairs to see if there was any milk downstairs so she could make me some cocoa. And she had a stroke on the way back up, and she was never the same again. And I stopped taking the pills. Uh, and it kind of shocked me into the rest of, into the rest of my life. But uh, I don't know quite what happened, but um, I began to get better after that. It was such a shock, I think, mm. that I had done that to my mother, or felt that I'd done that to and my you mother. You felt that you'd done that. Obviously, you're not in a great place yourself. This mm -hmm. is around. So this is you know the, around the time that this is the mid '60s when mm -hmm. your pop career. Let's talk mm. about um, that time, which you write about oh. beautifully in the book. This, 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 uh, well, before we do that, actually, the bit where you go to a Cliff Richard gig oh. is wonderful. There's oh. this young, young girl just absolutely euphoric to be at this Cliff Richard concert. And uh -huh. then you see him afterwards and backstage and he's not very happy. But oh, <laughs> I know. He, 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 was, he, oh, he was leaning against the dressing room table and there were all these people in the dressing room, the smoky, horrible dressing room and all these old people in it. And there was him, dark-eyed, looking like he just hated everybody and especially hated me. I was 16 and uh, I just couldn't understand and I felt really sorry for him mm -hmm. uh, that he, would, he must have been hating his life. And I wrote that in the book and I've got this wonderful photograph of him glowering. <laughs> I just, oh, he, he was just so wonderful to me then. And I sent the book, well, Lee sent the book to Bob Stanley. Um, Bob Stanley wrote to me and said, well, you know his father had just died. Oh, <laughs> right, wow. <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't no, it wasn't me. And it wasn't because he, <laughs> <laughs> oh, because he hated everybody. It was because his dad had just died. Awesome. So thanks, Bob. Well, I love the idea of, that, of the 16-year-old Vashti Bunyan at a Cliff Richard concert. It filmed me with such joy. Oh. Um, you had, you had, um, you had, had neighbours who worked in theatres and you went yes. to Blackpool and you saw yes. concerts. And, yes. and obviously then you have this short-lived pop career, which sort of, the mythology, your, your story, uh, we've, we've talked about this, uh, it's been mythologised a little bit, you know, this wonderful romantic journey, but obviously yes. the background of your actual journey, which we'll talk about in a minute, there's other things going on. Mm -hmm. um, and your pop career, you know, was this, you were exploited and all this kind of stuff. And obviously there is that going on, but also yes. you enjoyed the summer. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. And I've been portrayed as this little fragile folk singer who Andrew Lou Goldham took and tried to make into a pop singer. I wanted to be a pop singer. I never wanted to be a folk singer or to sing little folk songs as I, as I saw it. I wanted the world that he showed me. And... Uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I, I could read a bit about it, yep, if you like. That would be wonderful, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I've got it here. I don't know quite how much I'm allowed to read. There was a party given by our old neighbours, the Blacks, the impresarios and stage people, at Apple Tree, Qu uh, Apple Tree Wick, just before my 20th birthday. My mother persuaded me to go with her and I reluctantly took my guitar and sat down on the edge of, gilt, of a gilt chair, 
in a room full of once famous actresses, singers, people of the stage, mink coats, diamonds and pearls, patent leather shoes, gin and tonics, mum happily back with friends. I chose to quietly sing, How Do I Know? probably hoping to raise some perfect eyebrows with its reference to having babies by different fathers and still <laughs> being free. I remember making no impression amongst the clinking glasses and high laughter, but I must have done on one woman there, an agent called Monty Mackey from the Al Parker Agency in Mayfair. Mrs. Mackey knew Andrew Lou Golden, 21-year-old manager of the Rolling Stones and ex-manager of Marianne Faithful. I was called to the Mayfair office to meet him and sing some of my songs. There, I was surrounded by the theatrical plush typical of the day, the swags of red velvet and golden tassels, a grand piano with silver frame signed photographs from grateful and loving clients, a white marble fireplace with an ornate electric fire, Mrs. Mackey sitting silently behind her large desk, and there was Andrew, standing, shining, with his back to the mantelpiece and gilt frame mirror. I doubt we exchanged glances and there were no words. Me, long white socks, small skirt, holy jumper, old guitar, moody demeanor and croaking voice. Andrew, blonde and perfectly otherworldly, looking down or at the ceiling. Sent away after a few songs, I had no thought that anything would come of the meeting but next day I was again summoned, this time to Andrew's office in Ivor Court at the other end of Gloucester Place. He handed me an acetate recording of the Rolling Stones' Some Things Just Stick in Your Mind. This was to be my first single, a Mick Jagger and Keith Richards song. But I want to record my songs. One of mine could go on the B-side, said Andrew, and my second single could be one of my own. I was not happy. I went home and complained at my father. He said, quite uncharacteristically, compromise, dear girl. I did. I set out on a path I had not planned, but it surely had its moments. The contrast between the traditional impresario's world that I had glimpsed through our neighbors, the blacks, and their, and their friends, with this, Andrew Lou Goldham sweeping it all aside, resting the reins and reclaiming music for the young. It warmed my contrary little heart. I was just 20, Andrew a year older. He had already brought the stones to dazzling success, and I was surely dazzled, but also aware I was around something quite world-changing, and I was quietly delighting in being a small part of the big fuck you. <laughs> as much as I was terrified by them all, Andrew and his wordless way with me, Mick Jagger imitating my small voice with his head to the side and both hands together to his ear. The many, many musicians all crowded into the studio. It felt good that these young people were taking the place of the old. Andrew Lugolden strode this new world with an irreverential grace. He made me laugh when I wasn't weeping. Later, it swelled my heart as I watched him walk up to a stiffly uniformed doorman in the Park Lane Hotel, holding a large joint and asking for a light before <laughs> sweeping through the revolving door into the London streets in a cloud of illicit smoke. In a letter to my sister, I confessed to being a little in love with Andrew, but since he and I barely exchanged a word, I remained a small, skinny being, merging with the studio walls, silent, wide-eyed and almost not there. I sang, why does the sky turn gray every night, sunrise again in time? Why do you think of the first love you had, some things just stick in your mind? Why does the rain fall down on the earth? Why do the clouds keep crying? Why do you sleep curled up like a child? Some things just stick in your mind. Why, when the children grow up and leave, still remember their nursery rhymes? Why must there be so much hate in their lives? Some things just stick in their minds. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, 1965. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Thank wonderful you. writing. It's just <laughs> wonderful. And that's a, a passage that captures your rebelliousness and your heart and your shyness, mm. but also your yeah, delight. Loving being there. <laughs> Absolutely loving being there, yes. So let's get on to the journey. So um, mm. you live in a field behind an art school for a little while. In a wood under a rhododendron bush, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I did. With your then... Um, with, with my then partner, with Robert then partner Lewis. Robert, yeah. who you met yeah. as a somebody who... You, another old, an old boyfriend of yours and you picked up as a hitchhiker. Yes. And you just kept in touch. Like yes. He had a rebellious spirit that um, mm -hmm. connected with yours and also had had a, you know, as you've hinted about, a, diff a very difficult a, a hard time, yes, yeah. really. And both of you knew the thing to do was to go. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. the, the inspiration for this was Donovan's... Uh, yeah. What, the what, land of well, Donovan. <laughs> the land of Donovan, yes. He had bought um, a, a bit of the Isle of Skye and some islands off the coast of the Isle of Skye. And he wanted to uh, create some, not exactly a community, but just a, a collection of people with of like minds, creative people, painters and writers. And he, he thought it would be a West Coast Renaissance. And he was a friend of a friend of Robert's at, at his art school. Um, and when, well, Robert and I had already found a horse and a cart that we wanted to buy, but we had absolutely nothing. Um, but when we met Donovan and he talked about this place on Sky that he wanted to people with people like us. He lent us the money to buy the horse and the cart. They all, he, Donovan and his friends all went up in a Land Rover. Um, it never occurred to me and Robert it might take us a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> and it did, it took two summers and a winter to, to get there. By that time, a lot of people had gone. <laughs> But there still wasn't a place for us to stay there. And, you know, the whole journey that I describe in the book, when we got to the end of the journey and there wasn't a place for us, you'd think it would be heartbreaking, but it wasn't. Because we had changed so much along the journey, um, become very self-sufficient, really, and it didn't matter. And we just carried on to the Outer Hebrides, <laughs> where we did find a place to stay. You talk about how the, one of the reasons the journey started as well is because you're you had a dog, Blue. Ah, oh, yes, my dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, animals yes. are a big part in this book. They, um, they are, yes. And um, obviously, you have Blue. Um, your dad, who's not a very well behaved dog, and your dad doesn't want him, and you living oh, in the house anymore. Well, <laughs> no, it was because my dog cracked in the surgery door when a patient was due because I hadn't gotten out of bed. <laughs> to take him out. And so my father said, well, either the dog has to go or you have to go. And so I went and lived under a rhododendron bush with Robert. And then you buy Bess. And the story Bess, of Bess yes. is almost like a book by itself. <laughs> it's quite lovely. Yeah. Sinead Gleeson and I were talking about how we just... Bess is in our hearts now and oh, we'll never leave. Oh, I'm so glad she <laughs> um, was the most wonderful, wonderful creature. And your life is basically about you know, surviving and subsisting. You know, uh, there's a lot of people who think, you know, you're going on a journey to Sky, you know, and there's lots of people who did that with means. They had money. They had parents yeah. to go ask for money. You had no money. We didn't have anything at all. You no. had a, kind of um, a few things you could sell, but then yeah, on the journey yes. you were collecting things and selling things. And yes, and, and, yeah, and uh, digging gardens and cleaning windows and things like that. And you had to look after the animals, and that's what kept you going. Yes, it kept us going, and it made me so much better as well to know that I had to look after the horse, I had to look after the dog, we had to find grass, we had to find water, we had to find wood for the fire. And all of that made me, uh, well, it took my mind off me, <laughs> and, and I was, it made me so much better, uh, just bit by bit through the journey, um, facing real things, real people real policemen who were horrible to us and all of those things and also finding the most incredible kindness along the way uh, of people who really did accept us and some people just thought we were gypsies and that we were going to steal their children or their chickens or something 
uh, but there were other people who were so kind and accepting and liked what we were doing. Um, yeah. Tell us about some, some of those. There are some wonderful, I think, characters. You know, they're not characters. They're rounded people in this book. You know, mm -hmm. they come off the page. Um, uh -huh. You yeah. know, I want to talk about Wally, but Wally is quite far oh, along yeah, the journey. Well, yes, um, yes, but yes. Um, tell us about some of the people who, you know, like their kindness, you know, helped yeah. you survive, you know. Yeah, know. well, well, yeah, I think the, the main people were uh, when we got to the end of the first summer and it was getting really, really cold and wet and the dogs were wet and we didn't have a stove or anything like that. And so nowhere to dry our clothes or anything. And someone told us about a caravan site where we might find a caravan with a stove in it and to, that we'd be able to rent for the winter. Couldn't find it. Um, asked a man at the side of the road for directions. And he was curious because uh, we were in an old Austin at the time, a 1930-something Austin, belonging to a friend. Um, and he looked at the car and he looked and said, what are you doing? And he said, we were on our way to Sky, but you know, we've got to stop for the winter. He said, oh, well, me and my wife are going up to the Outer Hebrides tomorrow. Uh, you'd better come and have a cup of tea and meet her. So we went in to meet her, Iris McFarlane and Mac McFarlane. And they gave us their house within about 15 minutes, knowing nothing about us. They gave us their house to stay in for the winter while they went up to the croft they'd bought, which was a ruin, had a tree in one side of it. <laughs> and uh, They lived there for the winter while we lived in their house with an arger and a bathroom and uh, beds. <laughs> and it was just wonderful. And, why did they do that? And who would do that now to people that they'd never met? Um, they just liked what we were doing. And the, you know, the, the kindred of them doing their crazy thing and us doing our crazy thing, <laughs> all, all heading for the same dream, really. Mm -hmm. um, they, they were the kindest people. I've never forgotten. Mm. And um, you, know, you mentioned in the book, you know, these incredible women, you know, lots of older women who are yes. yeah. wayward. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And, inspire, oh, and yes. still inspire you, you know. Really inspired me. It, certainly when we got to Burnery in the Outer Hebrides. And this is after you've been after to Skye. After we'd and been to Skye and we, there was nowhere for us and we carried on to the Outer Hebrides. And the, the women on the Isle of Burnery, um, they, they, they did inspire me because they were, they were quiet and they looked as if they were doing what they were told, but they were rebellious, I, I say in the book, un, rebellious in undercover ways, yeah. like helping the hippies at Ferry Cottage. And <laughs> they, you know, they, they, they ah. the younger people on the island were afraid that Robert and I were making friends with the older women so that when they died, we would be given their crafts. And that, that could not have been further from the truth. But that was why we weren't liked by the younger generation. They thought that we were going to come in and steal something from them. Um, and yet the, the women that we befriended, who fed us, gave us milk, um, stories, the stories that they gave us were, were magical. And I will never forget those those people, although I only stayed on Burnery for six months because I was pregnant, I got scared um, of having a baby in an old falling down cottage with an earth floor. And I thought, you know, I would be helicoptered off to Inverness in order to have the baby. And I, I went back to my adored brother down in Sussex and... Uh, left the Hebrides, left that life altogether, mm -hmm. and took off on another one. Mm. And you, you know, reading the book, you know, I'm, I'm like thinking, going, did you ever think about giving up? You know, because there are some times you do come off the journey, there's somebody who offers you mm -hmm. some gigs, and you leave to yeah. do the gigs, but then you come back, you know, obviously you've got the animals to yeah. look after, but so you don't think, I'll stop here with the animals. No, no, we have to keep going. You know, there's, yeah. There was the, the, the determination to get there. Yeah, and it was, and it was kind of the, the animals, because Robert and I most definitely didn't get on an awful lot of the time. 
And so there was no question of us splitting up because then who was going to take the horse? <laughs> who was going to take the dog? And so it kept us going, really. It was a pretty good way of staying together with something. <laughs> <laughs> to have a horse. Yeah, and you talk about you know, that relationship and you know what happened mm -hmm. later, which I will leave you to read in the book. Um, in terms of music, you now obviously music is accompanying you on this journey. Or you know, got these songs, yeah. and I was very privileged to when I went to Vashti's house in Edinburgh see her, the book, your song book, <laughs> which is one of the most beautiful <laughs> things. It's stitched together. Beautiful mm. handwriting, all your original lyrics, some songs mm. that didn't make it. That didn't and, make it, yeah. And I didn't take any pictures of them for my archives. I was just like, oh, this <laughs> is all, these, all these songs that were never mm. out. And, um, but, you know, just, you know, just, you know, it was obviously a, a companion. Um, and, you know, the album, you've, you've said this in the book, the album that came out is a kind of, it's a version of the story. And yeah. It's a, you know, it's it's about the dream, isn't it, the album? It's definitely about the dream and definitely didn't have much reality in it. But it was, I wrote the songs to keep us going, really. And the, the happiest song, like Jog Along Bess, I, I wrote sitting against a stone wall in the mist and murk of a lonely glen in <laughs> Scotland uh, with midges <laughs> and... Uh, I wrote this incredibly happy wee song and it, I wrote it to keep us going. I, I had no idea of recording any of it, but just to keep us going and, and it kind of did. And then you do record them. You know, Joe Boyd showed yes, interest I, in your I, yeah. songs, you know, mm -hmm. back in the mid-60s, but you didn't want to do anything mm. to do with making music after your experience <laughs> yes. um, in your, in your yeah. pop career. Um, mm. But he's, you know, he stuck to his word and you stuck to your word and you yes, recorded yeah. them. Um, when you, you know, obviously that album is a wonderful album and it's much loved. Um, you know, so many, I heard of the Vashti's gig on the weekend, I don't know if anybody here or online was at Vashti's concert at the Barbican, but I was told there's lots of younger people there. Yes. Um, so, you know, your music has been introduced to you know, new generations. Yeah. Um, what is it like to sing songs from that record now? You know, knowing that you had this large part of yeah. your life when you, the last thing you would want to do was oh. to sing those songs? I never, never, ever dreamed of singing, of performing those songs at all. And particularly Jog Along Bess that I just mentioned. Um, the, the, the guy who plays guitar with me, uh, Gareth Dixon, when we were on tour in America, he and another guitarist would play the chords of Jog Along Bess because they, they really liked just playing around with them. And I would say, no, 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 I'm never, ever, ever going to play that one, ever, <laughs> ever, ever, ever. And then the other night at the Barbican, we did. Oh. And it was, it was absolutely wonderful because the, the violins and the recorders, everybody was playing on it. And, and the keyboard, everything, everything, and everybody that was around me on the stage. And I just thought, I could never have dreamed that this would happen, that I would be singing Jog Along Best with all these other musicians on the stage in the Barbican. So, yeah, it was it was wonderful, wonderful feeling. And, and a full house, fantastic. <laughs> and obviously then you made more music, you made two more albums, yeah. which are wonderful. The second of which um, you produced yourself, going on a music production course that mm -hmm. um, you told me. The teacher oh, said, oh, oh, you're not going to be able to do it. He, I didn't actually go because he wouldn't let me. Oh, so, oh I see. No, so you taught it, yourself? I, did, I had to teach myself. Oh, yes, I, I tried to apply. I applied to that course. He said, oh, no, you, no you're far too old. You, will, you won't be able to understand it. And so, I, yeah, I did. It took me seven years, but I did it. <laughs> Good for you. Um, what, what's next for us? Because, you know, you've oh, written a book next? and there yeah. are still, you know, your, your creative juices are flowing. You can't stop now. Oh, well. I know you want to rest because you've had a busy weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, what now? I think this Barbican show has been ahead of me for so long that now, and I couldn't even see beyond it. You know, I was so terrified. Um, and now it's done and I can't quite believe that it's, behind me and I, I don't know I can't see the rest of it I can't see the rest of, <laughs> of my life now because that was such a big part of it and then when this arrived at my door I thought wow 
<laughs> I actually did that. But what else, what else will I do? Well, the other thing actually that did happen was that I, picking up my guitar again, which I hadn't for two years, to, to rehearse for, for the Barbican, I thought, oh, this is all right. And then the little keyboard that I had to use to, to tune the guitar, I thought, oh, <laughs> this is all right. So I don't know. I don't know if something, it, it does seem to go in cycles. So. Let's hope. Um, for the moment, enjoy your book being out and people reading it and enjoying oh. it. And it's been getting great reviews, quite rightly, because it is wonderful. Oh, thank um, you. Thank you, Jude. But certainly, congratulations on the book. Um, we have a bit of time for some questions now. If anybody has a question to ask, there's a question here. I don't know if we can see. Um, there's a mic. There's a mic coming along. Oh, it's a mic in there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 55 years ago, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a speech as well as a question. I'll keep it, keep it short. If you okay, can, 55 right. years ago, I was, uh, I was going to go to a um, Franciscan monastery to hear a keyboard player, <laughs> and I was persuaded by a certain guy with a big tie to work on a session. And the session was uh, with a young lady called Vashti, and the session, the, uh, the, the song went... Baby, baby, it's late, oh. and you'd better go. It's after three, <laughs> and you can sing the rest. <laughs> oh, beautiful. <laughs> the coldest night of the year. I worked with you on that. Coldest oh, night of the how year. How wonderful. Lovely to see you. I love. I love that. It's recording. a great record. So too, thank isn't you. It? Thank yeah. you. I think it had John Paul Jones, Jim Sullivan, Joe Moretti, and, and Nicky Hopkins. Nicky Hopkins. Uh, Andy White, who played. Right. You know, uh, was it uh, Jimmy Page? I don't know. Yeah, oh, so all many those, All those guys working with you. How beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for the Well, memory. it was Andrew Oldham. Yeah, yeah. His, yeah. his production. That's um, right, yeah. Pi Studio huge, One. Huge, huge, how huge. Time, yeah. Yeah. How times have uh, how times changed have for both of you. 55 years later. Ones. How are you? Right. <laughs> Lovely to oh, see you. Thank beautiful you. to see you. <laughs> thank you. This, thank you so much. Thank you thank for the you. evening. Thank you very much. Wow. And yeah, I know Sinead well. met somebody she hadn't seen for years earlier. So this is like a reunion. <laughs> Who will I meet tonight? Um, and there's another question. There was one up here, I think. Yeah. Howard, were Hi. there things that you'd forgotten that in focusing on your past and on the book came back to light? They've always been, been in there. Um, Sorry, I, I can't really hear terribly much said, what you were asking me. No, no, I said, uh, were there things from your past that you'd forgotten that in going back and focusing on the writing sort of came to the surface? That, that came, came to the surface? Not really, because I think I've always held the story. Um, I may not have got it right in places. <laughs> I may have remembered some of it wrong. But, um, yes, it, it wasn't difficult to to get back to those stories because they've been in my head and I've probably told other people the stories many times. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot I've forgotten, but the things I have remembered, I've remembered pretty clearly. I hope I've got them mm -hmm. right. I will probably hear from some people. Well, no, actually it didn't happen like that. <laughs> and it wasn't then, it was now. And, uh, but uh, hopefully I've got most of it, right. And you've had some of the, you, know, you had some stuff found that you kept from those, the, from yes. those years that yes. informed it. And yes. I wanted to ask actually what your children think of your book because you wanted to write this for your children initially. Yes, and, you know, yes. It took a little yes. while, <laughs> but you did it write did it. It did take a while, yes. Um, uh, I don't really know yet. <laughs> <laughs> you waited for the reviews. Um, well, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly, yes. I and mean, they didn't know anything much about my musical past at all. And, and yes, that's why I tried to write it for them to explain a bit of how their lives had been. Um, and actually, when Just Another Diamond Day came out in 2000, my, my uh, youngest son was just 14, and he said, you don't know what it's like for me to have it be known that my mother was a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> But he has forgiven me. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any more questions? We've got time for one or two. If anybody else has a question, I can't see very well here. Anyway. <laughs> I would be very shy. Um, yes. 
Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks, oh. Sophia. We've got a microphone coming down for you now. Thank you. Um, just, you know, just wondering whether you think such a journey, a quest that you did back then, was it something that would be possible today and how, you know, how that would be today? I mean, it's kind of oh. an impossible question, but, I, you know, it just yeah. seems like something... It's the sort of thing that I dream about doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The same kindness, perhaps, that you were back when you did the journey, but it's just curious yeah. about that. I think it would be very hard now. I think it also... I think we were so innocent, we had absolutely no idea how to do any of this, and we just we just went ahead and do it, did it. But I think now people would be more aware, maybe, of the dangers. I wasn't aware of any danger at all, and yet, of course, it was all around me. Um, but I think people are mo more aware now uh, of danger. Uh, and so it might be a, a more difficult decision to take, to, to make that kind of journey. And when I made the decision, I didn't think I had any other choice. I had to, I had to go. Um, and maybe people aren't so much in that position now. I don't know. I don't know. But I wouldn't at all like it if any of my children had done something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so I don't know. But you also said to, to me when we spoke at the, the Guardian interview recently, you know, you wouldn't change that you'd done it for the world. You know, oh, what you no. learned. Yeah, and what I learned, yes. And you also said... This was when was this? We spoke in late February, and you said, "Oh well, I, sometimes I still have that urge to just run away." Just go. My book's out in a month. I'm terrified. I need to run. Oh, no. <laughs> oh the day before the Barbican show. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and you obviously you did stay in Scotland. You know, you mm -hmm. live in Edinburgh now, and yes. you did live until your musical career came back. You know, you yeah. were you know living a fairly unconventional life, which is also in the book as well. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes, I've been much more normal recently. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know obviously we've been talking about the book, but do you buy it? I was, it, it was surprising, it was incredibly sad at points, it was very funny at some points. And Michael Palin and Terry Jones even have a cameo <laughs> in it when you know them. I loved that bit. And Cliff Richard, you know, when yeah. we've oh. talked enough about Cliff Richard. But um, oh. it's a wonderful, surprising and fantastic book and I really genuinely recommend it. It um, blindsided me. It was, it was wonderful. Um, oh, it's been an absolute you. pleasure to talk to you, oh, Ashley. Thank and you. thank you, everybody, for your questions <laughs> thank you, thank for you. tonight. <laughs> thank thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.